Longtime viewers of this channel and members of the Contextual Electronics course will know of my deep abiding love for KiCad. And that's what we use in the course and for a couple reasons. One, it's open source. Two, it's free. Part of being open source. And I think it's really flexible too. I think that that is one of the most exciting things about it. The fact that there is a community around it building out additional extensions. We talk about that a little bit in this show with John Evans, who's one of the lead developers. Really exciting thing about the KiCad development team is that many of them are electronics designers themselves. And so they're thinking about people like me, like you, about how we might be wanting to use the program and all of the things that are affecting users on a daily basis. There is an upcoming version of KiCad happening, V6, that we talk about here in the show. John is kind enough to showcase some of the features and we talk through how things are going to be changing in v6 i'm very excited for it personally i think it continues to move KiCad along the path towards a more and more professional tool i do use KiCad professionally in my consulting work and i think it is a capable tool to do that sort of thing so i hope you enjoy this episode with john evans and from the core development team of KiCad. if you haven't seen it there's many other videos here on the channel about KiCad from KaiCon. You can see John talking there as well. And uh, I'm really looking forward to future developments of the platform. I'm here with John Evans, and today we're going to be talking about KiCad or KiCad. And we're going to also be talking about designing next versions of electronics using V6 and beyond. Welcome, John. How are you doing? Hi, Chris. Uh, great to be on the show. I'm doing well. Yeah, it's good to have you here. There are so many exciting new things coming, and I, uh, you, you had done a, a live stream along with other the other uh, developers back in I don't know mid twenty twenty or so. Actually, no, by late twenty twenty, and you did so many great demos then. I really appreciated that. Uh, how long have you been working on the project? Oh, I'm I'm uh, coming up on five years now of of being involved in one way or another, and I've uh, I've been sort of heavily involved uh, in in the in the core development uh, since since about when version five was released and we started really working on version six. I have to wonder like is it is it super empowering to just be like, huh, I really wish the CAD program would do this. Oh, I could just go do <laughs> is that like Absolutely. something is that like a regular basis for you? How does that work? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That that's actually how I got started. You know, my very first uh KeyCAD contribution was uh you know I was I was using it for something and I, 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 I think it was um, in the in the board editor. I was just like, why, why can't I do this? And and this in the in the case was uh, um, making a, making a layer like an arbitrary color. Um, for those who've been using KiCad for a while, you might remember back in the day, uh, you couldn't actually use any color. You could only use like a, a certain palette of colors because of the uh, sort of the graphics technique that we were using. Um, mixing colors together, there was only certain colors that worked, um, and I I didn't really know about the technical background of that limitation. I just thought it was a limitation. I wanted to use a different color theme, and uh, sort of started digging in, and you know, quickly found out it was a it was a more complicated problem than I thought, which is why no one had done it before. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was a, it was a great way to sort of learn about how the how the code worked, and uh, yeah, that that feeling of uh, oh, why doesn't it do this? So wait, maybe I can make it do that. Is uh, yeah. keeps coming it's back. Empower empowering and yeah, and and it's funny too because I remember talking to some of the other developers at uh, the conference back in 2019, and it was a pretty common story too. Where it was like, oh yeah, I started digging in. Like, how hard could this be? And then like the complexity of just like the years and years of like building a, a CAD program from scratch is uh, pretty significant. It feels like. Absolutely. I, I totally understand why some people's approach to that is, you know, they see it and they, they run away and say, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna build my own CAD program because <laughs> they don't yeah. they don't want to take the time to to learn the history of the code base. And you know, I think yeah. I think both approaches are, are valuable, but I really think, you know, even though there's a lot of complexity and history in, in the KeyCAD code base, you know, over the you know three decades it's been around, I think there's, you know, a lot of value in that. It kind of, you know, has has grown with the users, and and we've uh, been you know seeing over the years what what people are doing with it and what people want to be able to do with it, and all of that is kind of encoded into where KiCad is today, and and I think uh, it's a it's a great place to build on, even though it does uh, 
take some uh, some barrier of entry to sort of figure it out. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, that's uh, it's not a quick. There's no quick start uh, guide aside from well, get it to build first. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, although that's gotten a lot better. Um, and another thing that's interesting to me is that like a lot of the I think almost all the developers are like have electronics background or are practicing electronics designers, yourself included. I mean, you you work at a a fairly large like you know electronics design group inside of a 3D printer company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I lead the electronics team at Form Labs, and and yeah, I think uh, having input from various you know various different corners of the electronics uh, world, whether that's uh, people working in industry like I do, whether it's uh, people who are sort of um, focused on one particular part of electronics design, like uh, people who do you know high speed layout or things like that, um, and also people who are you know not coming from a industry point of view but are coming from a you know more personal project point of view but one way or another they're they're using the tool and they want to improve the tool that they use i think that's a you know obviously it helps to motivate people but it also helps to uh you know have all these different use cases within the development team that we can discuss um, it's not not like building a product where the people who build the product are, are disconnected from the, the people who will use the product right if you or i were like designing a product for 100 year old uh, people that would probably be a, a tough one to to kind of dog food and try out right because it's just like you don't have that experience versus in this case it's like yeah people know how what they want on a regular basis or, or they're trying to fix something that annoys them personally so <laughs> mm -hmm. that's that's a great use case what's what i mean what is it uh, like at form labs i mean is is uh big team small team i don't really uh i don't so know the yeah yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it's a little over 500 people in the whole company, so it's uh, it's not a little startup, but it's also not super huge. Um, and mm -hmm. in in the you know electronics team, it's uh, it's eight of us, so you know it's uh, I think it's a good size. It's uh, not not small enough that that uh, everyone is you know burdened by having a million different things going on and and no no breathing room. But mm -hmm. also it's uh, you know. It's it's not a huge corporate culture where you have you know different teams that aren't talking to each other or doing different kinds of electronics design or things like that. Yeah, yeah, I'd imagine. I mean, Formlabs has been around for Formlabs has been around for a while now too. So then you start to get into like sustaining engineering and just keeping products alive and manufacturable and just cranking out that next thing while you're also working. Absolutely, know, working on the, yeah. On the it's existing a... one that's making money, you know, like you have to just keep things going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it started out as uh, just a Kickstarter project, and you know, when you have when you have that kind of thing, and you have everybody working on one product, and then the one product gets out there, and you have to see how people are using it and fixing it. That's a totally different atmosphere from where we are now, where you know, there's uh, feels feels more like an established company where we have you know, as you said, sustaining engineering efforts, new R and D, you know, uh, product introduction, things like that. Yeah. I mean, kind of parallels the KiCad development, right? I mean, there is this ongoing base of people that are using the stable, using the the stuff that's already out there. But then there's people like you that are developing that next thing that's that's in the new code base in version six or five point nine nine until V six is released. I mean, so what what is that new product introduction? That new product fanciness that's going to be coming in V six that people should be excited about. Oh, where to even start? I think V6 <laughs> is probably the biggest KiCad release ever um, in terms oh, really? of wow. how much it changes uh, and and how how much people will notice it having changed. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly, certainly in terms of impact, I think just because the you know the number of people using KiCad has grown uh, so much over time, like the number of people who will be moving from version five to six, I think is going to be you know oh, yeah. a lot higher than from four to five, just because you know, um, more and more people have, have started using KiCad. Um, but I think if I had to sort of sum up where we are going with version six, it's uh, it's trying to work on smoothing over some of the rough edges that, that people complain about in KiCad and trying to, you know, close the gaps between KiCad and some other tools that people might consider using. So make it make it relevant to more use cases and make it easier to to get into KiCad from zero experience with with electrical CAD or from experience with another tool. Um, so we've just sort of looked at all of the ways in which um, you know people have pointed out KiCad is a little bit different, a little bit quirky um, compared to what they might be used to, and and tried to address as many of those as we could. 
And also, you know, there's a long list of, of features that people have requested, you know, hey, CAD tool X can do this, why can't KeyCAD do this? And so there, there's some juicy ones in there that we've managed to add for version six, and we've uh, got a long list ahead for version seven and version eight and yeah. on and on. Yeah. I mean, it's tough when there is, there are so many like different viewpoints, so much history in the industry, so many, I mean, like you said, different, different people using different programs that are like, oh, I really liked feature X or feature Y. And now those try to, you know, trying to kind of bolt these things on, but also make it feel like this whole thing that we actually isn't isn't just like menu after menu after menu after menu item you know right right and i think that's you know one of the challenges you know we were talking earlier about how you know keycat has been around forever and can be kind of hard hard to get into as a developer if you aren't used to like these big legacy programs um one of the hardest things about achieving those goals in keycat is just the legacy like it's really easy to start from zero and develop you know, a philosophy for the user experience and the UI of a, of a program and then just stick to it. But when you have an existing program and you you have, you know, identified faults with the UI, like this, this is obviously confusing to people, doesn't work as well as we want it to work. We have to also consider, but this is also how it works and how it has worked for <laughs> decades. Right. And so not only do we have to design a good UI, but we have to design a you know, an experience that people can transition into who have already been using KeyCAD because we don't want to just blow up what we have already and and make everyone completely relearn something that feels foreign again. Mm -hmm. So we're we're also thinking about you know, some sometimes blowing parts of it up is the right move and and you know one of the things that we've done is um, this you know the schematic editor for example the way that you interact with with objects in the schematic, like selecting things and moving them around, was just very strange in, in previous versions of KeyCAD compared to what people are used to in most other editing tools. And there we felt like we could just change to the standard kind of paradigm that it's used in other tools. And yes, people who are very used to the old way would notice a change, but they would also probably be able to pick up that change pretty quickly because it's the same paradigm that so many other pieces of software, including our own PCB editor, already use. Mm -hmm. And there are other cases where it's it's harder to figure out what the right move is because we can look at other commercial CAD tools or other open source CAD tools. And sometimes we think, you know, no one's doing a great job here with this uh, <laughs> particular thing. Like, uh, you know, CAD is, is not one of the places where you see a lot of like, you know, award-winning user experience and, and things right, like yeah. that. Yeah. So we, such we, a joy to use. So yeah, you know, it's yeah. like, oh, my, my Mac, my, my iPad is just such a smooth experience and no one's saying that about, about CAD programs, huh? Yeah. And, and there are a few places where, you know, there's some, some, uh, some of the commercial tools are really trying to push on user experience and have, have made some progress there. And I, I think we, you know, we keep looking at those and, thinking about, you know, how does how does that map to something that we could realistically do in KeyCAD and, you know, have have a have a path for people to learn the new paradigm and, mm -hmm. you know, implement it into the code that already exists. That's cool. That's cool. So um, you have a demo project we could maybe kind of use as like a basis for talking about stuff. Obviously, if people are just listening to this, there is a video version, so you can go and check that out. Otherwise, you can go and download version 5.99. There is a nightly available. You can try it out. I personally, I keep it on a VM. I think it's great for just keeping it kind of playgrounded myself. And uh, but it doesn't. You don't even need to do that. It's pretty easy to to keep it separate in you know a Linux repo or as a separate Windows install, right? Yeah, if you're if you're using Linux or Windows, it's very easy to install both the nightly development version and the stable release on the same computer. And there's no problem with the programs fighting with each other like there was uh, in the past. Uh, you just have to watch out for your design files. Once you uh, once you open your design in the nightly, you can't go back to the old stable release. So so mm -hmm. uh, work work on a backup copy. Yes, that's right. That's right. Cool. So, what are we what are we going to be looking at here as a as an example? Yeah. So, so what I have here is uh, this this project called Stick Hub, which is uh, uh, one of our new demo projects. This was contributed by a KeyCat user, and it's a it's a new demo for for version six um, that shows off uh, some of the new features like uh, like curved traces in the PCB. 
but I wanted to start by showing the schematic editor and um, just showing that now, you know, the biggest change is, like I said, how you interact with objects. So now you can just click on objects and they're selected. And uh, if, if you haven't used KiCad before, this might seem a little bit obvious, but, you yeah. know, KiCad didn't have this in the past. Like there was no uh, concept of just like having something selected. Um, it was either not selected or you were already doing something with it. You were, you know, you, you select and move or select and rotate or something like that. But now, you know, you can, you can drag <laughs> Are things around. you saying I have to ha have an extra <laughs> click, John? Is that what I'm hearing? Oh my gosh, so many extra clicks. <laughs> well, if, you know, if, if you really want to use KiCad quickly, I would say the, the thing to do is to learn the hotkeys. And that's something that oh, yeah. we've maintained from the, you know, the previous version, um, all of the things that you do with the mouse, you can also do often faster with the hotkeys. And so you can also just, you know, grab parts with a single key press and move them around. Um, yep. But we it think took, that- It took me far too long to realize that the the, the old hotkey uh, index, like the thing that showed like all of the, all the hotkeys, it used to be on the question mark button. And now I think it actually is very smartly, I think control F1 or F1 is basically how you like have that show up. And uh, yeah, that, that is how I learned the program to start with. I, I've always said that that's the best way to 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 get started, just because you like you keep kind of getting that repetition in there. It's, and now there's even a search function, which I don't think it had mm -hmm. back in BZR thirty one oh four or whatever it was. <laughs> so, but yeah, um, I think you'll notice uh, there's you know visually a lot of change here. We've completely redone our icon pack, and uh, we did that for a couple of reasons. One was uh, we needed to sort out some licensing issues with uh, the old icons where some of them we didn't really have clear records of the author and the license and, and we needed to uh, just make sure that we were starting from a position of having a good license and all the icons. But we also took that opportunity to uh, develop an icon design language and we worked with a graphic designer and sort of developed uh, you know a set of colors and a set of uh, design rules and things like that so that um, not only do we have you know, 500 icons that are all sort of designed the same way now, but we also have a guideline for developing new icons in the future as we develop new features um, and hopefully can avoid uh, some of the issues that we've seen in the past uh, with KiCad and, and other open source projects where the, the visual design language can be sort of all over the place with, uh, with no you know, guidelines for keeping things consistent. Um, and one of the other things that's allowed, um, and I, I can't show it off here because I'm on uh, Windows at the moment, which is the one platform where this doesn't work, but on, on Linux and Mac, we now have support for the operating system's dark mode. And, and so, you know, we can have a dark icon theme that, um, for, for users who are using those operating systems. Cool. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And I mean, so I think from a first glance, like, you know, like top line, the graphics, like you said, or the icons rather that, that, that is different, but like, it still looks like a schematic to me. I mean, like, it's not like so radically different that it's like, oh, I don't even know what program this is. Whereas, you know, I look at an all team schematic. I know it's an all team schematic. I look at an Eagle schematic. I know it's an Eagle schematic. And so this still looks like ICAD to me that it's still got mm -hmm. that same, that same look and feel and kind of color scheme, I guess. Yeah, yeah, we wanted to maintain that that KiCad feel and and just make subtle improvements where we could. So the the list of things that has changed here, I mean, it's going to take a while to compile. We're going to have to do that at one point, you know, actually yeah, write yeah. the the release notes. Um, you know, there's there's just hundreds and hundreds of of small improvements and and big improvements um, in the schematic editor. Um, you know, one of the things is that you know net classes can now be defined in the schematic. It used to be. This was something mm -hmm. that you would do in the PCB, but now you can say at, at schematic time, okay, here's some high speed nets or here's some you know power nets and, and set them up here. And you can actually give them different thicknesses and colors and line styles and things like that. So if you want all your all your power nets to be thicker than your signal nets, you can do that in the schematic mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I think that's another thing too, where it's, you know, for, for a long time, like the, you know, the... Uh, the net classes was a scary thing that like, I, you know, I told people like, oh, well, you don't really need to use it at all. But you know, as you start doing high speed stuff, you want to have controlled impedances. It just becomes so critical to uh, just to keep things separate, especially as designs get more complex too, because you want to, you, know, you have so many different types of, of uh, maybe controlled impedance lines or, or requirements for a specific uh, 
uh, output of spec. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that we've been doing, you know, both on the schematic side and on the PCB side is trying to make KiCad more applicable to more types of designs. And that includes high speed designs or high power designs or, or any kind of situation where in previous versions of KiCad, it was really hard to sort of define the design rules and, and the requirements for your design, whether that's a, a lot of different impedance control requirements or uh, current carrying capacity on traces or things like that. So one of the things I'll show later is uh, we have you know, a, a really big upgrade to the design rule system. And, you know, part of that is defining net classes, but part of that is also being able to, uh, you know, set up custom rules for specific situations where, you know, previous versions of KiCad had sort of a one size fits all design rules that didn't really work for a lot of advanced PCBs. Right. Yeah. If you have different, uh, even different sections within a PCB, you might want to have uh, the analog section have different rules in the digital section, that sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah, so speaking of the PCB, I can I can pull one up here, um, and uh, there's uh, perhaps a little bit more visually different on the PCB editor than than on the schematic editor. Um, just at first glance, we've uh, you know redone this right panel here, where you you choose uh, what things are visible, and and um, and there's now a, a list of nets and net classes here, so you can actually. Uh, scroll through nets here and, and turn them on and off and hide the rat's nest lines, which can really help on busy boards. Um, but we also have uh, these presets for displays, and you can add your own custom presets. So this just makes uh, working with busy designs um, even better because you can now use this uh, control tab hotkey to just cycle through different presets of layers. So if there's uh, inner layers, there's none on this design, or I can just say, I only want front layers, or maybe I only want back layers. Mm -hmm. And if there's a particular set of layers for your design that, that matters to you, like maybe you want to set up a specific view for routing certain traces against uh, reference planes, you can save that preset and you can pull that up in the list in addition to the built-in ones. And yeah. we've also made it so that you can change the transparency of, of different types of objects. So you can see here, I can, I can make the filled areas in these zones uh, translucent and keep the tracks uh, fully opaque. Um, and there's a lot of little tweaks like this that we've done to make busier boards easier to navigate in the PCB. And generally just trying to make KiCad an uh, easier place to be if you're dealing with a complex design. Yeah, that's one of the things where like, it, especially for beginners, it feels like trying, it's so much information and you're trying to kind of parse, you know, you, say you have a neat layer board and you're trying to see all these things, see all these things at once, right? You're peering through different layers, you having different cutouts. It's just, it can be really confusing, especially if you start getting into really crazy things like blind and buried vias and just trying to visualize that stuff. So this is very much appreciated. Yeah, and another thing is, um, you know, we can, um, in previous versions of KiCad, you could go into what was called high contrast mode and sort of make, make things fade out. And this is nice for some situations, but still, you know, especially when you're talking about like an eight layer board or something like that, um, even the faded out stuff can still be distracting. And so you can now, you know, hit that hotkey one more time, and now you're only looking at one layer at a time. And you mm -hmm. can still, you know, quickly toggle through which layer you're looking at, um, and with a single hotkey, get back to showing more of the context. You know, previously you had to go over here and, you know, hit a bunch of checkboxes and turn layers on and off. Um, so now it's a lot easier to navigate those kind of boards. Yeah. Yeah, it is usability. That's That's really great. That's awesome. And I think that, you know, like, like I said, uh, you know, like some of the mental just viewing of this stuff is it's going to be a skill regardless, right? Some people watching this are very likely beginners or interested in PCB layout. You know, some of it is just going to be learning some of these methodologies, some of the conventions that are part of uh, ECAD programs, it feels like. So what is the, what is the split of like beginner versus, you know, more advanced type of stuff. It seems like this is maybe skewing more towards the advanced. That's a good question. I, I I wish I knew. I mean, we don't we don't have very good statistics on the whole user base. I mean, we you know we don't we don't collect a lot of information you know from from every KiCad user. I mean, we've done some surveys in the past to uh, you know places like the KiCad user forum, but uh, that's only going to capture you know a certain subset of the people who actually use KiCad. So 
we can find out about those users and we can sort of find out, you know, users who report bugs to us. Um, sometimes, sometimes you can tell what kind of work they're doing, uh, if, you know, depending on how much information they share with us. Um, but I think what we've seen is um, KiCad has always been recommended to um, to beginners, to hobbyists, to students, to um, you know anyone who needs a good tool that is also you know free of charge, where you know they can't they can't uh, you know justify paying for for a tool, and you know until until fairly recently there weren't a lot of good options other than KiCad that could both do you know a wide variety of tasks in in electronics design and were free of charge, um, and we've also seen recently a lot more users who you know they don't care as much about the free of charge part um they care about other things that might you know, be either pushing them towards an open source tool or pushing mm -hmm. them away from you know whatever commercial tool they have been using um yeah. and one thing that's been that's been big is sort of control over data and and control over licensing you know, um, a lot of companies these days are, are looking at how they can move away from perpetual licenses to uh, subscription wow. licenses for, <laughs> for, for all software. Um, obviously, yeah. you know, from a, from a um, you know, business point of view, subscriptions are, are pretty attractive. Um, you know, they sort of guarantee recurring revenue. Um, but it does create a lot of, you know, unease with, with the designer community I've, I've seen where people are worried about losing access to their designs things like that. So one thing that KiCad offers is there's no way you're ever going to lose access to your design. And, uh, you know, even if you, you know, if, if you decide that you want to operate with a certain KiCad version, you're never going to be forced to upgrade to the new version if you don't yeah. want to. And so I, I think there's been, you know, for, for those kind of reasons and for other reasons, we've seen, you know, more, more professional users come to KiCad in the past years. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like what you were talking about with people, you know, gently guiding people towards these new features, these new uh, locations of just maybe where to click and where to, you know, just people's workflow. And it's like with some of the cloud tools, even when they are updating for a a arguably, objectively better flow or way of doing things, it's just like you're blowing someone's up. So blowing up someone's workflow on a daily basis now, instead of like this opt in, like, oh yeah, I'm ready to move to the next version. And mm -hmm. like, I'm ready to, to like sit down and make sure that I'm good to go. And it's not the day before my boards do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so there, there is a, a lot of that pushback. And then like you had also said, like, it seems like the ecosystem kind of the, the ecosystem stuff has Maybe that's a software one. I'm not sure. Like I personally, I feel like the, so much of the you know, there's the the core developers, but then even like the bomb plugins and and things like that that a lot of the KiCad community has has pushed back in. Like it, that is so valuable to me that that I can just find something. There's people out there that are doing Python scripting or doing other stuff out there that when I'm in a bind, I can just kind of Google around and find something. Absolutely, I think you know the KiCad community is definitely its biggest asset, and and just. It's it's incredibly motivating to me and the other developers to see the people who are mm. not only using KiCad and showing off like the boards they make with it, but also you know contributing library parts, contributing Python scripts, and things like that. Um, mm. It's definitely when you when you compare to some of the other options of uh, even you know commercial software might be very capable, but if you try to find support from the community, you yeah. know it might be might be kind of hard to find. Like there's not there's not just a you know, a user base of people who will, you know, chat with you in real time and try to help resolve your issues. And, you know, I think one of the other things that is is kind of paradoxical about, about uh, you know, the, the nightly nightly builds of uh, KiCad and like you said, the people who are, you know, enthusiastically testing that and, 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 and sort of living on the, on the, on the danger zone of, of uh, you know, run, running into bugs. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we, we really appreciate the people who are who are doing that and and they are providing a really invaluable service because you know whenever we have a you know a, a serious kind of bug um that you know misses the development team we find out about it from those users really quickly like we mm -hmm. have people reporting stuff and and you know within hours um, um and this this really allows us to you know focus in on those on those critical things and get them fixed quickly and I think one of the things I've I've 
heard from people in the community is that they really appreciate how quickly KiCad fixes serious problems. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, there might be, you know, people people might wish for a certain feature and it might be a complicated feature. And yeah, those, those can take years to figure out how to do. Um, mm -hmm. But there's some bug that's crashing KiCad. Like we want it fixed today. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. if, we, if we can't fix it today, it's because it's a hard problem and we're still working on it. Um, and not not because we don't prioritize it, whereas uh, I, I've I've seen some complaints about various other tools out there, you know, open source or commercial, where you know serious crash problems can can stick around for for way sure. longer than people expect. Right. Yeah. And then it's again, it's like a business thing of like, what is the cost of your business being down for days at a time or weeks at a time? And you know, if you can't pay someone to fix it, even it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> good luck. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. So and speaking uh, of that, it's you know, it's really exciting now. Like that, if if people don't know, we now have um, uh, some of our developers have started a a, a company, the uh, KeyCAD Surfaces company, where mm -hmm. they offer paid support and and paid development. And I think it's it's great to have both. Um, you know, the the um, the volunteer developers like myself who are who are working on you know what we what we feel like working on and and contributing when we when we can and then also have the option of you know oh say you want to pay for this thing because you know you feel like it's not getting prioritized by the you know the volunteers like me you can do that now and i think mm -hmm. it's uh it's it's going to be really great for the project to have that have that uh as an option for you know supporting professional users who you know like you said you know if if, if something's broken for them it, it really matters how quickly it gets fixed. Yeah, I'm still a little disappointed they didn't go with the name Lead Hat instead of Red Hat, but <laughs> they, uh, it's okay. I guess, you know, I guess, you know, KeyCAD Professional Services is also good, you know, but whatever. Uh <laughs> well, you'll, you'll have to, you'll have to complain to Seth about his, uh, his I will. I will. lack of humor and his name. Yeah. Speaking of Seth, so I actually texted him in preparation for having this recording and I wanted to verify because Seth will be hosting uh KaiCon KeyCon uh 2021 which is a go and so that is happening in 2021 oh, that's, in that's October. great to hear yeah so uh more more to come on that that'll be in October of 2021 uh in the newly opened California as as of today's recording so that's that's very exciting and we might get to all hang out and talk about our favorite CAD program in person which would be very very awesome after a year and a half of not being able to do that and missing out on going to CERN. Mm -hmm. oh, well. <laughs> well, maybe next year. But that's maybe that's great year. to hear. I know I know Seth's been working in the background for a while to make that happen. It's really good yeah. to hear that it's that it's going to happen. And you know, yes, yes, there's going to be a lot of caveats to having that kind of event this year. Yeah. But you know, we're we're doing what we can. And and like you said, you know, after a year and a half, it's going to be really good. I really I really enjoyed the last KeyCon, so I'm I'm really looking forward yeah. to this. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So uh, if we can get back to the um, some of the, the features. So you mentioned the DRC stuff, and I feel like that's one of the ones where it's this hard thing to explain to people, especially people that are getting started, right? Some of the people listening are getting started here. What is DRC? Why does it matter? And then how is it changing in this case? Because mm -hmm. it feels like that's that's kind of a game changer, it feels like to me. And it also feels like it's like kind of this background feature otherwise. you know, It's not something that's visual. It's something that's more rules-based. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so DRC or, or design rules in in general is uh, is how you tell KiCad or or any um, electrical CAD tool what the requirements of your design are when you're when you're laying out a PCB. So those requirements might come from different places. Like a lot of them come from the manufacturer of your board. You know, you might know I'm going to send this this uh, board to Oshpark or whoever your manufacturer is, and they will have certain equipment that's actually going to, you know, set up your your board and 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 expose all the copper and 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 mill it out and all of those steps in the manufacturing process have tolerances and and so you need to um, allow for those tolerances and so one part of design rules is making sure that you don't accidentally design something in CAD that can't be built in the real world. Like uh, you know, lines are just too close together. They're actually going to short out if you try to if you try to manufacture that in the real world or things like that. Yeah, it's like and, bumper bowling for uh, PCBs, right? You'd make sure yeah. you can't uh, can't go in the gutter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you know, making sure that your board can actually be made is is part of it. 
And another part of it is making sure your board works properly, even if even if the manufacturer can make it. You know, um, all all of the copper on a board has certain electrical properties, and and those electrical properties, you know, matter in different situations. Like if you're if you're trying to, you know, power some kind of high power device off of your PCB. You know, all of that current for that device has to go through traces on your PCB. And so you want to make sure that the resistance of those traces is going to be low enough that the, the copper in the board doesn't actually, you know, heat itself up to the point that it fails. And there's a bunch of other stuff like that. When you get into a higher speed design, you have to start thinking about signal integrity. And if you're trying to uh, make a product and, and release it, you have to worry about... Uh, EMC and, and whether your board is going to be unintentionally radiating uh, noise into the world and things like that. Um, how you lay out the board and you know, exactly where you put different pieces of copper matters a lot to the success of your board, um, especially when you get into you know, higher end uh, layouts, when, you, when you're talking about uh, you know, sensitive analog circuits or high speed digital circuits or things like that. And what design rules does is it allows you to sort of offload some of that thinking to the computer. Definitely not all of that thinking. Like you definitely still have to think <laughs> for yourself a little bit, but you can at least tell the computer um, some of the things about what will make your circuit work or what will what what your circuit needs in terms of the the physical copper on the board. And then, as you're designing the board, the design rule checker. Um, can in some cases just prevent you from doing things that are going to violate those rules, and in other cases, you know, notify you later if you if you accidentally violated any of those rules and 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 give you an opportunity to fix it. So when we talk about design rule checking, you know, that's that's what we're talking about. Is uh, it's it's only as good as the rules you put into it. So if you configure your rules correctly, it will tell you if your design meets those rules, but. Unfortunately, it can't tell you if those rules are the the right rules to make your product successful. Right. But right. you know, it, it can it can help with part of it. Yeah, yeah, that's and I actually I think that was one of the things that kind of brought me to the program in the first place was the I had been coming from Eagle where you could just you could lay a line over top of line over top of line and at the end yeah it tells you oh yeah actually you you busted that it, it you can't you can't put two lines you hit across the streams but you know in KiCad you could bounces off of things because yeah, the live DRC is there and it's preventing you from doing the things you shouldn't be doing. And like mm -hmm. you said, you can always go back and mess something up later. And so you still have to do that final check. But the, the idea that you're checking it as I go, that's, that's, that's very important because I, I, my brain loves making mistakes like that, I think. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the biggest engineering challenges in, in bringing the new DRC system to KiCad is that it's, it's not just a, a final check at the end. It happens in real time as you're drawing traces with the router. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, now that the new system allows you to have a different clearance in one part of the board than the other and all kinds of things like that that people have been asking yeah. for, we had to make all of that work in real time. Um, and, and so and it there stacks was a, up, right? I mean, there's yeah. a lot of math there. I, I, yeah. So I, on, on the ABC board, which is one of the boards that I designed for the, the contextual electronics course, I have a bunch of parallel lines there and they, it was getting real tight. And, uh, you know, so as I started to push things together, uh, there's shifting that happens around with a push and shove router that came out in V5, which was a great feature that people, V4 maybe even, mm -hmm. whatever it was, uh, you know, people love that I love it. It's, it's um, amazing. But as it's pushing, as it's, you know, one trace runs into another and it moves something else, it has to calculate like, hey, can I move? Do I have any room to move? And as you have multiple lines stacking up, it becomes difficult. And now the rules might be different for line one to line two to line three and it's just exactly like, yeah, it really it'd be it's a lot of it's a lot of math I, i've always been surprised about how much math is in there yeah and that's you know that what you're talking about like uh you know shoving 10 lines around a board is something that you know we've we've gotten real test cases from some commercial users of KiCad who are you know designing products and they have you know shared their designs with us privately because they're interested in helping make KiCad work better on these large designs and it's been very helpful to have these enormous boards that you know you just don't see these uh on the uh on the open source hardware sites like you know it's talking right, right. you know well, different than an at mega 328p uh you know with just routing out to headers it's like okay well that's that's one thing but there's also you know, 1200 yeah. bgas that are doing their own thing right it's like exactly you know you know huge bgas you know 16 plus layers things like that and and 
we we have really spent a lot of time trying to make sure that as we're adding these DRC features that we're not, you know, compromising the, the speed of using KiCad and creating huge lag. Um, and I think, you know, we've done a pretty good job. There's definitely still room for improvement there. But um, I, I'm actually quite impressed with how KiCad is able to handle large designs um, in, in the nightly builds today, you know, compared to some other software I've used. Yeah. Can can you show a little bit of the what the DRC looks like? Because it is more kind of scripty now, right? The, yeah. The so new version. so there there's uh, there's two options. So um, when I open up um, the board setup here, um, there's there's two places where you can set the design rules, and part of them is this uh, this page called constraints, and this is fairly similar to what was in previous versions of KiCad. There's there's some new stuff here, but overall. What this page does is it lets you set constraints that apply everywhere to the whole board. So, you know, if you get word from your manufacturer, like everywhere on this board, you know, I need to have minimum clearance of, you know, 0.15 millimeters, you can put that in there. And then, you know, no matter what else you do, this will always be the absolute minimum clearance. Mm -hmm. And so then there's, um, there's I, I, I said too, there's actually three places because you can, you can come in and, and define net classes, and this allows you to say, you know, I have this set of nets, like these are all my power nets, and they all need to carry more current. So I want to make sure that my tracks in the power net class are, are a little bit bigger. So you can set that up here. And then the, the new part is, is what's called custom rules. And like Chris was saying, this is a, a more of a scripting way of, um, of defining design rules. And you know, I could I could talk for a while about this, but basically, the the really short description of how this works is you um, you you figure out where you want the rule to apply, and where where could be like a, a physical region. Like I want this rule to apply, you know, in this little corner of the board, or it could be uh, um, you know uh, a matter of the properties of the objects, like. When uh, when net A runs up against net B, I want this rule to mm -hmm. apply. So you you know whatever your um, condition is, uh, you're going to have a way of defining that condition um, by writing some kind of expression. And we have a you know a help system that explains all of the different things that you can write in here, and a lot of different examples for for common use cases that have come up um, from our from our beta testers who have been using this um, yeah. in the nightly builds to to you know design real boards. Um, so once you define where the rule applies, then you just define, you know, what the rule is like, you know, this rule is giving a minimum copper clearance, but you can also, you know, have a lot of different rule types. Like you can, you know, uh, control how wide a track is, or you can uh, control how close together two footprints can be. You can control differential pairs and net length and things like that. So, um, we are, you know, we, we know that this is, uh, in its early stages. I mean, this has been a, a pretty complicated system to build. And we know, you know, some people would prefer to have some kind of like a wizard system to define yeah. rules where which are more graphical and, and less sort of uh, programmy. Um, and where we've decided to go with this is to do the sort of the architecture first. And mm. this, this scripting system that gives you all the control and now that this exists, it, it's actually pretty easy to think about building a UI that sort of automatically creates rules for you based on some kind of a wizard. And so we expect to see people building that in the community via Python plugins and things like that. And we'll also consider, you know, in future versions of KiCad, adding more UI here. Um, you know, one of the things we're thinking about is we can make this text editor better. Like if you've used a, a modern programmer's text editor, they mm. can do things like you know, auto-complete entire sentences for you in, in your programming language of choice. And we could do that kind of thing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like uh, automatic lookup and so that it's like, oh, here are the nets that are available to assign to this sort exactly. of action. Exactly. And we have a little bit of that already. Like, uh, you know, if we have um, you know, we have some some amount of auto-complete for things, um, but I think, I think that's uh, definitely an area where we, we think that this is kind of a new approach to doing design rules. It's not something we see out there in, in other tools. And it's always a risk doing something like that. And, you know, we, we definitely 
talked about the various ways that we could answer people's uh, desire for more flexible design rules. And what we concluded is that we weren't really happy with any of the implementations that we were looking at as like um, the, the nice solution to the problem. And we've been trying to care about user experience and trying to make a nice solution. And we think that starting here is actually going to lead to a nicer place in the end um, than just jumping into, you know, one, one way we could have gone is just having a, a, a ton of different UIs for setting up, yeah. you know, I want a rule in this area or something like this. Um, but, you know, one, one fact is it would have just taken forever and we might, you know, we might not have nearly as many new design rules as we do um, if we had, had to build a, a separate UI for defining each one. Yeah. What's also interesting is that, I mean, it does feel like there's more software people that are interested in hardware coming into the space anyway. So it does feel like for the people that are kind of software wizards, they can just kind of pick this up and go, maybe script it, like you said. Um, how, how has that been impacting other parts of the the program? And I mean, do you, or is this even a trend you're seeing? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we're working on the background um, that's not quite ready for the for the public yet, but but will be by the time version six is ready, is a is a new Python API that will make it easier for uh, people in the community, individuals or or companies to develop add-ons for KiCad that that make it do things that it can't today. And we've definitely seen, you know, there are a lot of people out there who are KiCad users and you know don't want to dive into the you know admittedly complex and and uh, storied. <laughs> Uh, C++ <laughs> code base of, of KiCad. Oh, you're, you're a politician now as well. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, they can they can write a little Python script, you know. Um, I think, uh, you know, what I've seen, you know, in my in my professional life is um, for for hardware engineers, knowing knowing software development or at least knowing, you know, some kinds of software development, like, you know, quickly developing a Python script or something like that is, is more and more important. I think, um, you know, the days of, you know, someone you know, being in the professional world and, and laying out complicated PCBs and just like not knowing any programming at all um, are, are numbered, I think. So mm -hmm. we've, we've seen more and more um, people who would be comfortable um, doing this kind of basic programming um, and, and we want to empower that. So we're definitely, like I said, working on a, a new and improved Python API that, that makes it easier to, and, and make, and makes it possible to automate more tasks in KiCad and um, make it easier for people to discover those things that that people, other people have made uh, sort of plugins to KiCad um, so that we we want to see that community grow and thrive. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing I'm actually excited about as an external, I'm not much of a scripter myself, but like uh, seeing people do things like, you know, wanting, wanting to like set up automated builds and, and similar things using APIs, um, that kind of stuff is is really useful. And it makes for consistency, whereas, you know, certain things in graphical programming, graphical, you know, tools like this, it's just tough to make consistent, right? You always have to click the same thing in the same order or do the same thing in the same way each time. And it's kind of down to personal rigor instead of like a computer doing it for you. And now it's like, oh yeah, okay. So now if you start being able to script this, you can make it so you, it's one click button, maybe all the stuff gets exported at once or one click button and all of the, all of the LEDs get put into a circular ring or, you know, and on and on and on and on. There's lots mm -hmm. of ways that the scripting can be used. Um, so that's, uh, yeah. Do you have a good like example project that you think is like a good way to get started with scripting in, inside of the, inside of the CAD program? Um, I, I think, uh, placing, you know, LEDs, like you said, is a, is a great example. Like, you know, something where you want to um, do something a little bit tedious. Like if you, mm. if you are, you know, say you're designing your own keyboard or, or something like that, where you have, uh, you know, a bunch of switches to place, a bunch of LEDs to place, something like that. If you can figure out, um, you know, a, a simple way to describe in, in Python code, you know, where the center of each part should be, um, then that's a pretty easy script to write. And I've, I've seen a lot of those out there and they tend to be pretty specific to the application. So if you have a specific application for, you know, placing parts precisely, I think that's a great place to start in terms of seeing how scripting can, can help your workflow. Mm -hmm. And in general, I think, you know, this is the thing that I'm really excited about 
for you know one of one of the things I'm really excited about the new Python API enabling is there are so many different little use cases for KiCad that people have that you know they're the only person who needs it to do exactly what they need it to do and when the development team is you know looking at feedback coming in of like I wish KiCad could do this or I wish it would do this differently or things like that we sort of have to apply an averaging like we can't we can't add everyone's specific request in the specific way they want all the time um, especially when you know people are requesting things that are in conflict with each other and one of the, you know we can take the approach of seeing okay most people want this or it seems like you know for the for the 80 percent of people this is going to be the right solution and add that into the main keycad code base um, but you know we still appreciate that there's then 20 percent of people that that's not quite right for them and mm -hmm. um, we can't you know we 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 don't want to take the approach of adding like 5,000 options to every single feature in KiCad so that everyone's particular style is accommodated everywhere. Um, you know, there's certainly places where we uh, want more flexibility in KiCad and, and we'll look at adding it, but there will always be a point at which we say, you know, this request is a little bit too specific. It's a little bit too out of the ordinary. And there's a cost to adding that to the main KiCad code base. I mean, it you know then becomes something we have to maintain and test and um, document and all of that stuff. And, and it becomes confusing for new users too. They're like, well, why exactly, do I need this yeah, they're overwhelmed. You know, which which one do I pick? Things like that. You know, yeah, where yeah. where we can, we you know, the the best option is no option when 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 that works out. Like, there's a lot of caveats to that. Um, you know, catchphrase where you, you certainly need configurability in a lot of spaces. But I think, you know, if there's, if there's uh, you know, a 99% versus 1% kind of use case, we would prefer to not have that extra checkbox there. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the scripting lets you do is serve the 1%. Like, you know, you can, if you're, if you find that you're in the minority in your opinion of how something should work, we want to enable you to make KiCad work that way anyway by by implementing it as a Python plugin. And so we we really look forward to, you know, making it easier to develop and publish Python plugins so that, you know, more people can do that. Yeah. Can you show just how is the console still there in V6? Like can you show what that looks like to to just kind of roll up a quick script? Not not that you have to like do one, but is the location of scripting the same? Yeah. So so there's uh, this icon up here it looks looks like a console and this opens a, a Python shell inside of KiCad, and um, you know you can you can directly start uh, live coding here. And um, people mm -hmm. use this in a couple of different ways. One, you can use it uh, to help develop a plugin. Like you can you can try things out and see what they do. It has an autocomplete, so you can sort of see okay, these are all the uh, the functions that are available and the API and things like that. Um, but you can also use it to just directly manipulate the board that's open. Like if you if you have some function that is just a few lines of Python, you can actually just run it directly here instead of uh, going through the trouble of you know creating a plugin and and all of that extra stuff. Got it. Yeah, that's super cool. And I mean, that's honestly that's not something how I work normally, but it's like that does seem like that would be such a enhancer of of uh, time and like you said, anything repeatable. LED panels, mm -hmm. <laughs> those are the those are the the bane of my existence of just like making sure those are placed right and stuff too. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I've I've seen some great things where people want to lay out LEDs on on a curve or on a spiral or something like that, where mm -hmm. you know the um, points on a spiral are pretty easy to describe in math, but pretty tedious to do by hand. So that's that's, right. that's yeah. a great example. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So, what are some of the things you're excited about in V6? Well, apart from you know the stuff we've already talked about, um, I I think that um, I'm I'm pretty excited about the workflow improvements to the PCB layout and and to the schematic editor. Like, there's there's just too much to cover here, but um, some of the things that we've done in the schematic make it a lot easier to build complex designs. Like we've we've overhauled how buses work and how how they pass signals between different sheets, and so. If you're dealing with a, a large design that has a lot of different sub circuits, it's a lot easier to do now. And we've we've just looked at like 
almost every different part of laying out the PCB, um, you know, the workflow that you go through and, and tried to make it as efficient as we can, like cut out unnecessary steps, make the tools work in a more consistent way and, and, and make the tools smarter, like, uh, you know, making, making the router do, uh, you know, do things that you might expect instead of things that you might not expect. Like some people who have used the, the KiCad router in the past have complained that it was it was sort of hard to get the results they wanted, and we've we've taken a look at those some of those problems and tried to fix them. Um, so so generally, I would say uh, you know version six gets out of your way and and helps you a lot more than previous versions of KiCad did, and I I am really excited to you know start doing more designs with that. I've I've been doing you know a few simple designs off and on, but I'm I'm excited for. KiCad 6 to be out and to see people doing more complicated designs with it and really to spend some time watching people using it and seeing, um, you know, how well we've done on, on improving the things that we tried from version 5 and also, you know, double checking our idea of, you know, what should we work on next? What should go into version 7? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's always a tough thing. It's, you know, there's only so many time, so many hours in the day and so many uh, developers on the project. So yeah, you gotta, you gotta, try and get that 80 percent of uh, what's going to be valuable so that's it's a, it's a tough tough role basically you have to be like a product manager as well as the person writing the code absolutely yeah i think that's a big part of you know being on the lead development team is uh it's not just writing code it's figuring out what code to write it's, mm -hmm. that yeah. often takes more time actually yeah and i mean so so now taking off your kaiket hat and putting on your double e hat i mean what do you see in terms of like people using this in the workplace, you've kind of already talked about it as a professional tool. You're seeing more people doing it. What do you think is going to take for until you know like market adoption, more people using it on a regular basis? I mean, like I use it professionally, but I'm you know a one person company versus mm -hmm. like a you know maybe any person company like yours or a hundred person company or a thousand you know like thousand double E's. That would be a lot of opinions, but uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know like so larger style companies as well. Yeah, so I, I sort of think there's two categories of, of things that, that keep people off of KiCad who might use KiCad or might want to use KiCad. Um, and one of them is sort of easier to figure out, which is, uh, you know, missing features. Like, um, even though we've we've done a lot of work for version 6 to, to add new features that people have been asking for, there is still, you know, a set of features, especially for advanced PCBs where... Um, KiCad just really doesn't compare yet to some of the commercial tools out there. Um, when when people are designing um, complex stackups like are, are needed for rigid flex boards or sort of high end RF work things like that, it can you know be you can certainly do that in KiCad. Like nothing is going to stop you from doing it. But the the productivity tools that are offered in some of the other commercial EDA suites are are just not there yet for those high end use cases. And so I think that's going to keep some groups off of KiCad. Um, but I think the the one that's um, maybe affecting more, I don't know, this is just a guess, you know, and it certainly applies applies to me personally, um, is just productivity in teams. You know, I think um, the, way, the way KiCad has developed um, over time has been, uh, you know, more focused on the individual user than on a team of users. And there's nothing specifically that prevents a team of users from using KiCad, but it's you know the same with the advanced uh, board layout techniques. Um, the commercial tools just make it a little bit more painless in, in some ways when it comes to mm -hmm. you know, collaborating on designs, uh, uh, especially collaborating on libraries and sort of uh, central library management and things like that. I think, um, this is this is something where where KiCad certainly has room to grow, and I think um, when people look at what would be involved in migrating to KiCad, um, I I think that the the collaboration workflow and the um, sort of the centralized management of of assets like footprints and and symbols and things like that is um, sometimes a sticking point. Um, Maybe not always because KiCad can't do something, but just because the way KiCad would want you to do something is is so different from what people are used to yeah. in the commercial software mm -hmm. that it just sort of uh, uh, you know makes them a, a little bit uh, uh, concerned about whether or not it's going to work out. 
So that's 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 what's on my mind in that regard. I mean, it's certainly something that I think about a lot. And um, you know, if if I think about what's coming up for version seven, um, I can relate a lot of things that are on the to do list back to those two uh, sort of sets of things. Yeah, yeah, it's re it's really interesting just kind of thinking about that as like a you know. It doesn't have to be all one type. You know, there's going to be many different ways to do a thing, and uh, you know, might be this program, might be another. But uh, uh, just kind of being curious about that because there are some some top level companies and programs that a lot of, you see a lot of people using. You know, and what it's going to take to get more people to migrate to KiCad. It's uh, it's it's interesting just seeing how that how that goes. So um, yeah, it's it's an exciting exciting future all the same, and I'm really glad mm -hmm. that people like you are are working on it. Uh, where can people find out more about what you're doing both, you know, in your in your day job and and professional life and then also for for the project and for KiCad and, you know, the community and and uh, and writing code and stuff. Yeah, well, I, I, I hang out in a variety of different places online. Uh, so so um, I, I often tweet about KiCad when there's uh, cool, cool new features yeah. that I, especially when I can uh, show a yeah. little video of something I, I um, I'm uh, at John Crafty John on Twitter, um, and I, I hang out on the KiCad Discord and a couple of other electrical engineering discords. Um, and I find you know that's been a great way to you know find out more about KiCad users and and uh, even you know watch some live streams of people using KiCad, which has been yeah. incredibly useful from a product management point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and I also hang out on the KiCad user forum and and of course all over the uh, the KiCad. Uh, uh, GitLab, where where people engage with us, asking for features and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, that is a that's a good way to start an engagement. But then you might also get a uh, pull request welcome. That's always the uh, <laughs> in meta a fun fun response. It's like, yeah, come on in, come on in. The water's fine. Try and change a color. You can do it, mm -hmm. folks. You can try it out. <laughs> well, John, I hope uh, I hope you and I can be uh, clinking glasses soon at uh, KaiCon 2021. And uh, absolutely talking more about this stuff. I'm really excited uh, for all the things that are to come and uh, all the work you're doing. So thank, thank you for doing that. Well, thank you, Chris. And I'm, I'm looking forward to Kaigon as well. All right. So that was our episode with John Evans, one of the lead developers for KiCad or KiCad. And you should definitely go check out V6. You can go and do that in a VM. You can download it. You could just download it directly and run the nightly. Specifically, it's usually a separate install, so that's really helpful, like John talked about. I think it's really worthwhile to go and see what's coming. There, of course, are always going to be some some things that are maybe a little bit rough around the edges still before we get the stable release out there. But you can also go and help out. You can file bugs. You can help with documentation. You can dive in and become part of this project that is an ever-growing project. There's also the forum.kiked.info if you haven't seen that. That's a great resource. Uh, a lot of helpful people over there. And John is one of the founding people on the Discord channel. There is John's always on the KaiKed Discord channel, helping people out, giving feedback, walk, working people through their problems. And so I will link that down below as well. I'm really appreciative to John and the entire KiCad team. Uh, we did a talk a little bit earlier, I guess it was 2020, we did a talk with all of them. It's really worthwhile to check out where they are thinking about going with, with the program. John obviously talked about a lot of that, but I think it's just a exciting time to be in this part of the electronics industry, more and more open source tools that are enabling people like myself, like all of you, and allowing you to jump in and participate in that way. So please consider jumping in, participating, donating, anything you can do to further the cause of KiCad. You know that I'm going to like it around here, and I think it'll benefit you as well. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Thanks for sharing these episodes on social media, and we'll see you in the next episode.